Would it be crazy to suggest that a game master can learn how to design adventures as good as anything they can buy from a game company? I think it's re very reasonable and I have a process that I use and I'm going to share with you today. My name is Travis Miller and I blog at the Grumpy Wizard blog. I write about classic adventure gaming, sword and sorcery fiction, and heavy metal. So let's get down to it. Sandbox campaigns actually make adventure design easier, but uh, this framework I'm going to show you will work for any kind of adventure that you want to make. You just have to adapt it. So what's an adventure? An adventure is a playable scenario for a tabletop role-playing game. It's just a connected group of encounters. An adventure has the same structure as an encounter. There's a hook, an obstacle, an objective, and connections. You need to have a reason why the players are going to interact. What are they going to do when they interact? What are they trying to accomplish? What's preventing them from accomplishing it? And then what else is out there for them to do? What's the next thing that they're going to grab onto and look at? There is no single way to create an adventure. Just because I'm telling you how to do this doesn't mean it's the only way. You can uh, take what I'm showing you, steal what works, and use that. Design starts with empathy. You want to start off by thinking about who this adventure is for. If you're designing an adventure for small children, that's going to look like something different than an adventure for adults who uh, are into horror movies. So think about who you're, you're designing this for. One of the first questions on our adventure design framework is, what is this adventure for? Is this a sandbox location? Is this a dungeon? Is this a starship that the players are going to be exploring? What is it for? What do you need to develop for your next session? If this is a convention game, if this is an open game at a free RPG day at a game shop, that's going to have some fundamentally different structures or it's going to have a different focus than a game for your regular campaign. So you'll need to keep that in mind and ask some questions. In our adventure example that we're going to create so that you can follow along is uh, I want to introduce players to the main village that is going to be the beginning of the campaign. And I want to set the tone for the campaign. I want them to kind of have an idea of what the campaign is going to feel like and look like as we go along. So the next question is what emotions and experiences will give players the, uh, what they want, what they want to get out of this, this thing. The emotions of the players are really important. And I think this is something that doesn't get talked about enough in RPG design. We play games because they make us feel a certain way. We play RPGs because they make us feel a certain way. You don't feel the same way when you're playing Advanced Squad Leader or Checkers or Monopoly that you do when you're playing a tabletop role-playing game. We play these games because they provide us with emotions. And what we put into the game as game masters and designers is going to cause players to feel a different way. So if we're going to, if we want our players to have a little fear or apprehension, we need to put something scary in the game. If we want them to feel heroic and triumphant, they have to have a reason to feel heroic and triumphant. There are a bunch of different uh, emotions that you can insert into your game to make the players feel amazing, feel whatever when they walk away. Memories create are created by emotion. 
the stronger the emotion, the more powerful the memory. And if you want your players to remember your adventures, you need to create powerful emotions. We also want to think about the experiences that are going to create those emotions. Or maybe you've come up with an idea that you really like and you want to insert a particular monster that your players have never fought in your campaign before. So you put that down, write that down as part of your framework. Or maybe you've thought of an interesting way to introduce players um, into a village with a tavern brawl rather than the usual quiet tavern uh, experience that uh, we kind of make fun of. In our adventure example, I want the players to feel heroic at the end of the adventure, and I want them to fight a werebore, or at least experience a werebore, whether they choose to fight it or run away from it is, is, another, is their choice. So our next stop on the design process is to determine the objectives. Remember, we talked about objectives in the encounters video. Encounters all have objectives and so do adventures. An adventure might have more than one objective, but the basic objective of the adventure is something that you can create. Now you will notice as we move along here, I'm going to be putting the uh, new entries at the bottom of the slide. This is because when you are writing this, you're going to, or I recommend that you do the same thing, that we're going to build this adventure in reverse. So our objective for this adventure is find the missing peasant and defeat the werebore threatening the village. Now, the werebore is going to be a secret monster that the players don't realize uh, is there. That's going to be a uh, investigation where the players will find a dead peasant and track the clues back to the werebore in the village who is hiding out determined our objectives and now we're going to make a list of NPCs, monsters, objects, and locations that we think we're going to need to design for our adventure. This doesn't have to be super detailed or comprehensive. It does help you think through what it is that you're going to need for this adventure and don't get too tied up with it. You're probably going to add more stuff to this and you're going to take some things off as you go along. This is a rough list that you're going to work off of as you process through the adventure. Here's our objects for our example adventure. Our next step is to make a rough outline using the reverse cause and effect method. What is the reverse cause and effect method? It's kind of what it sounds like. We have a an objective for our adventurers. They're going out to find the missing peasant. And in the process, they're going to find out there is a werebore in the village and they need to kill it, drive it out, defeat it, however they decide to do that. In order to do that, they have to confront the werebore. And you will notice I've marked on here fear and uncertainty. That's the emotion that I want the players to have in this encounter because I've written this for uh, low-level characters who maybe don't have magic items yet. So they're going to have to be creative about how they fight the werebore or drive it out of the village or help it get rid of its lycanthropy or whatever it is they're going to do. So I've filled in the rest of the card here with the series of encounters without going through each of them. You can see, though, that they each follow from logically from one to the next, but I've worked on them backwards. I've written them in backwards in order to think through 
what the path that the players might create. And I will sometimes just write these down, each one just a sentence down on an index card so that I can sort of shuffle them around, move them around, and, and develop a, uh, a mental image of how these are going to go. So now it's time to design the primary encounters and the possible alternatives. I'll do a quick recap on encounters, what encounters are and how they work, the way they work at the table during the during play is the game master presents the hook. The players observe what's going on in the encounter. They decide what they're going to do. They interact with the encounter, however they're going to interact with it. And the game master adjudicates the outcome of those interactions with the rules of the game and what they know about the situation. The order that I design encounters are similar to the way I design adventures. The objective, the obstacle, the hooks to the encounter, and then I start connecting encounters together. In our example, the adventurers are questioning some of the peasants in the neighborhood to figure out where they last saw the missing man. The peasant doesn't trust strangers and doesn't want to tell anybody, doesn't want to tell adventurers what he knows about anything. The players can decide how they want to address that, whether they want to try to intimidate them, buy, buy the peasant off to get them to spill their beans, or maybe they're going to rough him up. The hook for that encounter is the missing man's mother suggesting that the party talks to other peasants and the other peasants acting kind of shifty. We're designing encounters, the primary encounters, the ones that we have envisioned that the players will have to go and do in order to successfully achieve the objective. Then we'll also want to think about possible alternative actions that the players may take and encounters that that would generate. And you can jot those down, develop them completely if that's what you want to do. Those can be areas where you improvise encounters. You don't want to go crazy and what if yourself into a giant pile of work. Note that there's a possible alternative here, maybe create an NPC to cover that possibility and move on. Once we have an idea of what all the encounters are and we've created them, we can connect the encounters. The connections between encounters are what create the structure of the game. It's how the game begins to feel like a story, but not really actually be a story if you're playing a game. Adventures are not the game master telling a story. You are creating situations that the players are interacting with and then a story emerges after the adventure is over and then you're telling your, your friends about what happened. Adventures and games have multiple possible outcomes. Stories have fixed outcomes. The storyteller knows what happened. Even though this particular example could be thought of as a linear story or a linear adventure structure where the players are sort of seem to be going down a single line, we are not trying to railroad them into a specific path. We want to present clues and hooks between each encounter location and each NPC encounter that provides options to the players to decide about how they're going to proceed. An encounter can connect, you want to connect different encounters with each other by multiple hooks and clues so that when the players experience it, it will feel like they've been 
going from one encounter to the next encounter to the next encounter, but the possibility, the possible different encounter sequences are going to be different depending on the choices that the players make. I want to recommend to you that you be flexible when you are building encounters and building adventures. Don't expect the adventure to go exactly the way you think it's going to go. Build some flexibility into your adventure. Give yourself some room and give yourself some options if the players go off in some direction that you didn't anticipate. Avoid bottlenecks. It's, I think, a bad idea to create adventures where the players have to go through one space in order to get through the adventure. When you have multiple opportunities for the players to solve the problem and achieve the objective, you just end up with a better adventure. It's a lot more fun for the players. The three clue rule is a big one. Uh, I'm going to recommend a blog post by Justin Alexander of the Alexandrian about the three clue rule for any uh, conclusion that you want your players to come to. You need to create three clues to that conclusion. So if you need a murderer because you're running a murder mystery, you need at least three clues, possibly more, pointing to that murderer. Players will miss clues. Sometimes they won't go looking for a particular clue in a particular place. And if they only have one clue at hand, then it's going to be hard for them to figure out what's going on or where they need to go or what they need to do to solve the problem. You can recycle these encounters. If your players don't use an encounter and never see it and never expect it, you can take that encounter and use it in a different location, a different adventure, use it for a convention game. You don't have to waste material just because your players didn't use it this time. You can use it some other time. And even though I've created this big framework and a series of steps that you can go through, start wherever it is you start. If you happen to come up with a good idea for an encounter, write that down. If you come up with a good idea for an NPC or think of a great opening for an adventure hook, then write that down and then fit your pieces together as you go and work it all together. As long as you come up with a coherent adventure at the end of your process, that's the big thing. I'm just providing you with a structure that you can use to create your own adventures. I hope this information is useful to you when you're creating adventures for your own campaigns. If you sign up for my newsletter, you'll get a PDF that has all the information that I covered in this video, plus the detailed information about creating encounters that you will also find in this video. Thanks for watching.